After World War I, the losing Central Powers were subjected to peace treaties that were famously brutal. World War I was debatably the deadliest war in human history up at that point, certainly the deadliest in Europe, and while not every Allied power had the same idea for peace, some of them, like France, wanted extremely harsh revenge. There were also competing interests between the imperialism of victorious nations wanting to carve up coveted lands and colonies for themselves, and the rise of new forms of ethnic-based nationalism, with self-determination to make newly independent nations. No treaty or treaties were going to satisfy everyone. The most famous or infamous one was the Treaty of Versailles, which imposed military restrictions, giant reparation costs, and took a good chunk of land from Germany. The harshness of the treaty and the economic turmoil it brought was used as a popular talking point by the rising Nazi party to gain popularity and eventually take power, which would eventually lead to the even deadlier Second World War. Now, hindsight is 2020, and many today agree that yeah, Versailles was a little harsh, but some would argue that based on the demands brought to the table during the peace process, there was no combination of results that would have prevented World War II in some form. But of course, everyone on the internet has an opinion, so I thought of a cursed idea. What if you guys voted on the terms of the Treaty of Versailles? Not just that, how about the other treaties of World War I? Now, these treaties all had hundreds of articles and details, and I obviously wasn't going to nitpick everything. But this channel is clearly a geography-themed channel, so for five days I had up a survey where thousands of you from around the world voted on how you would hypothetically redraw the map of Europe and the Middle East after World War I. To try to keep this somewhat realistic and not too crazy, I kept in mind the general attitudes of the major Allied powers. France wanted harsh revenge, the US was more lenient and heavily supported self-determination, and the United Kingdom was somewhere in the middle. So for most questions, you had a harsher option, a lenient option, or a self-determination option. And whether it's the harsher or lenient or voting one, at least one of the options was going to be the same option that happened historically. So there was technically a chance that all of these treaties could have ended up the exact same way. That being said, it didn't. You guys changed some things. We're going to see how the five post-World War I treaties turned out in chronological order. The biggest one first. So as mentioned before, this is a geography-focused channel and these treaties are huge, so the map changes are what's being voted on here. Many harsh aspects of the treaty came from other things, but the loss of certain lands for Germany were definitely used as ammunition by the Nazis as an excuse for many of their policies. Of the bits of land that were given away by Germany in Europe, you guys changed four things. Firstly, my audience voted that while France would take back Alsace-Lorraine, they would not set up a Saarland protectorate. That area would remain German. This was a very important economical area for Germany that hurt to lose, especially as the Great Depression went on, and it ended up being the first place Nazi Germany would take in 1935. So perhaps this lessens the blow a tiny bit, but who can say? Secondly, the territory of Eupen Malmedy was voted to stay German instead of being given to Belgium. It's an often forgotten about loss of territory, but the area was basically entirely German and was mainly given away because the Allies felt that Belgium had to be compensated somehow. The third change is that in a relatively close vote, Danzig does not become an independent free city-state, but stays within Germany. But the final change was actually one where Germany didn't originally lose land. One of the areas that could have potentially gone to Poland was the southern area of East Prussia. In our timeline, there was a plebiscite for the entire region and they voted to stay German. However, in the poll you guys voted to split along ethnic lines, similar to how Silesia and the Polish Corridor were treated. So despite Germany keeping some small areas, they technically end up losing more by giving parts of southern East Prussia to Poland. Now, there is chance for Germany's borders to change again once we get to Austria's treaty, but we'll get there when we get there. For now, in this new Treaty of Versailles, we have Germany ending up not too terribly different. The last bit related to German territory from Versailles was Germany's overseas colonies in Africa, China, and the Pacific. And all of you guys voted for the colonies to be divided the exact same way as in our timeline, except for one little difference. In our timeline, German Samoa was given to New Zealand, which eventually became an independent Samoa in 1962. However, interestingly, you all voted to give German Samoa to the United States instead. 
Now, for those who don't know, Samoa since the late 1800s have been divided into a German colony and an American one. American Samoa is still owned by the United States to this day as a territory. If the U.S. acquires German Samoa, perhaps either all of Samoa gains independence in the Cold War, or maybe Samoa becomes the 51st state shortly after Alaska and Hawaii. Who knows? An interesting tiny change for sure. On to the next treaty. Austria-Hungary's fate after World War I was unique in that Austria and Hungary were forcibly split apart and had their own treaty each. Austria's came first, mainly because Hungary would go through a bit of chaos, but we'll get to that later. Austria lost a lot due to a huge amount of ethnic groups wanting independence or joining a neighboring country, and there was really no way of stopping it. So the questions were mainly about how to draw the borders. In regards to the border with Italy and Yugoslavia, Italy was still given the littoral region, the port of Zara, and Trentino. However, you guys voted to let Austria keep central Tyrol. You guys also voted to let Austria keep southern Styria, aka modern-day eastern Slovenia. However, in a shockingly close vote, you guys decided that the German-majority areas along the borders of Bohemia and Moravia should stay Austrian. This was a huge and divisive problem, as in 1919 these areas joined the newly formed Republican Austria as a breakaway state of German Austria, with the hope of joining Republican Germany. The Empire was gone, so there really wasn't a point in remaining distinct from their fellow German neighbors anymore. But the Allies decided that these lands would go to Czechoslovakia, and that Austria would not be allowed to unite with Germany. As I'm sure many of you remember, this was used as ammunition by the Nazis to Anschluss Austria and the Sudetenland in 1938. In an error margin, by only three votes, the Sudetenland is going to stay separate from Czechoslovakia. However, the Sudetenland was actually never a real region of Bohemia and Moravia. It was formed in 1938 when they drew a border along where the German populations were living at. So realistically, in this sort of scenario, rather than just lazily giving the Sudetenland to Austria, the way to do it was to take the divisions of Bohemia and Moravia, take the census results, and give the districts with a majority German population along the border to Austria. So the result is similar, but not quite as large as the Sudetenland of 1938. The final question, as I'm sure you're imagining by now, was also related to whether Austria should be allowed to join Germany or not. And you guys voted for a plebiscite on the option, which effectively means that soon after this treaty, Austria would join Weimar Germany, because they absolutely would have voted for it. This means that now Germany is much bigger than before. But even more interestingly, there is now less irredentist ammo for the Nazis to use should they still take power. I imagine Hitler would find any excuse to start a war if he needed it, but I can imagine in this scenario the Allies wouldn't even think about appeasement, as what would they need to feel sorry about? So ironically, this still significantly changes history. So Hungary's treaty was made after they had a brief communist insurrection and war with Romania in which they had their capital occupied. So similar to Austria, there's no stopping the loss of territory, just limiting how much in treaty form. Based on the questions on Hungary's different borders, you guys ended up choosing this outcome for Hungary. So they're not as punished as in our timeline territorially, but they still have lost a lot of territory. Ah, you guys probably forgot about Bulgaria, didn't you? Well, honestly, it's just as well, because out of Bulgaria's losses, you only changed it a tiny bit. Yep, that's it. But with all that in mind, here is what Central Europe now looks like with these four treaties in place in 1921, after those wars out east with Poland and the Soviet Union died down. You're probably wondering why I'm showing you this before the Ottoman Empire's treaty, and I'll explain that later. But for now, this is the new Europe. To be honest, Italy got less than in our timeline, so Mussolini is still definitely taking power. Whether the Nazis still happen, I don't know. On the one hand, they have much less nationalistic ammo to complain about, to win over support, or to use for appeasement. On the other hand, there were still the harsh economic and military aspects of the Treaty of Versailles that still made a huge impact. There's honestly just no way to know for sure. But overall, you guys seem to love plebiscites and partitions. Now, let's get on to the Middle East. So the Middle East had a slightly different scenario from Europe. 
Self-determination was still definitely a factor. There were some calls for a newly independent and unified Arab state under Faisal I, the Sharif of Mecca who famously helped Lawrence of Arabia, and incited a rebellion in Hadamid Hejaz. There was also the potential for a Kurdish or Armenian state as well. Greece also had ethnic claims on parts of Anatolia. But these interests competed with the British, French, and Italian imperialist desires. In our timeline, the imperialists definitely got the lion's share. Well, at least Britain and France did. Sorry, Italy. But you guys completely flipped the outcome here. The British were still given Palestine, and the French were still given Lebanon and coastal Syria. But Hejaz was granted the rest of the Fertile Crescent, and Kurdistan was given full independence. Wilsonian Armenia was also approved. Meanwhile in Anatolia, Italy and France's claims in the south were denied, and surprisingly, Greece was given Thrace and Constantinople, but not Smyrna or Bithynia. So basically the Ottomans are just boxed into western Anatolia. So this is a map of the Middle East in 1920. However, I had to make it 1920 because the next three years would undoubtedly be chaotic. In our timeline, the Treaty of Sevres had to be revised as the Turkish leader Ataturk pushed the Greeks out and solidified holdings out east, declaring the Republic of Turkey in 1923. You also had the Soviets who annexed what was left of Armenia in 1921. While Turkey is even more restricted with this treaty by losing Kurdistan, they also don't have to fight to keep mainland Anatolia from the Greeks. So the question is whether Ataturk in this scenario would still fight for Eastern Thrace or Kurdistan or not, and if he does, how would he go about it? There's also the slight chance that somehow the Soviets annex all of Armenia and expand into Anatolia before Ataturk has a chance to take it back. I honestly have no idea. So this map of Europe in 1921 cuts off the Middle East precisely because I can't even remotely predict what it would look like in the Middle East even a year later. So ultimately, this experiment was fun, interesting, and cursed. But it really hammers home the idea that there was not going to be a pretty ending to World War I. That being said, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and for Patreon supporters and channel members, you can get access to a special map of this alternate Weimar Germany that includes Austria and parts of Bohemia and Moravia. Anyway, I'm Emperor Tigerstar, and I'll see you guys next time.